Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of A Handful of Hope. I am so happy and grateful to have Garrett with us here today, who is a retired Marine Corps pilot transitioning from a career of military service, was a traumatic chapter in his life, one defined by near constant anxiety, regular panic attacks, and a battle with substance use. Through surviving the experience, he began a journey of personal discovery and a search for purpose and meaning in life. This journey led him to earn a certificate in applied positive psychology from the Flourishing Center and a certification as a human potential trainer from the Canfield Training Group. Garrett combined his training and insight gained from personal experience to create the Thriving in Your Recovery Program with a mission to serve others who are facing a similar struggle. Through his professional experience, education, and personal journey, he has cultivated a wealth of valuable insight and resources for overcoming adversity, developing resilience against addiction, and finding ways to use a troubled past and the challenges of today to build a better tomorrow. Garrett currently lives in New Bern, North Carolina. When he's not traveling around the world speaking or serving his favorite nonprofit, One Million Goal, he can be found loitering in a coffee shop, snapping pictures of a sunset, or strolling the town with his mini-me, his daughter, KK. Garrett, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure. Yeah, man, it's a great pleasure, too. You often remind me later to tell you about my, my sunset thing I do every year. It'd be cool to have you be a okay. part of it. But I want to make sure we dig in on this addiction piece, because one of my, my big concerns with this whole thing that's going on right now, and the recording date is April 29th, so for context for people, this is still in the middle <clears> of <throat> corona, COVID, lockdown, quarantine. I've been looking at different reports that have shown how alcohol consumption has risen worldwide. And the most recent one was just the New York Times, I think it was yesterday, was saying week after week trend over the periods of lockdown, there's been anywhere from a 26 to a 56 or something percent increase in alcohol consumption. And one of my big concerns has been, you know, what is the mental health fallout of this? You know, for your perspective, can you kind of walk us through, and I even saw something with the CDC record said that to be cautious of that because it could be fueling addiction or it could be, you know, mixed in with the anxiety and the fear that are out there. It could be creating almost a new addiction for people. Yeah. So maybe just walk us through some of the, like the steps, the signs of people developing an addiction so there can be an awareness of that first. Yeah, certainly. So there, there are metrics that we can track like alcohol sales and that gives us one indicator, but there's so many other things that people are now consuming a lot more. And it's not necessarily that they're consuming it that is a problem or that is troublesome. It's the fact that the benefit that it provides, whether that's alcohol, whether that's junk food, whether that's Netflix binging, whether that's getting on and watching, you know, adult videos or something, but all of these things have something in common that it provides a means of escape. It helps us discharge or numb some emotional pain, uh, whether that's stress from the uncertainty, stress because of your financial situation, a lack of meaning because you lost your job, a uh, lack of social connection because of the, the isolation or the physical distancing. All of these things create emotional stress inside of us. And when we seek something external to our body, whether it's a substance or a behavior, that helps us discharge or numb some of that discomfort. That in and of itself on a, you know, on a small basis, on a short basis, isn't a huge concern. But when we look at the length of time that people have been dealing with this new, you know, with this, this changed version of reality as they're living their life socially distanced, physically distanced, living in isolation, everything's changed. We look at how long that takes place. You've studied you know, personal development, human potential a lot. Uh, well, they say to create a new habit can take as short as 21 days to 60 days, depending on what that habit is. Well, we're looking at people that are continuing to expose themselves to this substance in greater quantities or this new behavior to help deal with that situation over a period of time, 40 to 60 days for many people. So that's what I'm most concerned about is that we are conditioning ourselves to these habits or these behaviors and we become accustomed to reaching for that or relying on that to deal with the emotional pain that we feel. And not only can that create a new habit for us, but it also diminishes our natural capacity to cope with the uncertainty, to cope with the struggles and challenges of life as we go through it. We lose those natural abilities uh, and become more reliant on these external things. So that's what concerns me the most is that over this period of time, we are diminishing in our capacity to deal with the challenges of life that will continue to come up for the rest of our life, the normal ups and downs, uh, ebbs and flows of life. We're diminishing that capacity potentially 
and becoming more uh, acceptant or reliant on something that's external to our bodies. And that could be whether that's alcohol as that metric that we can easily track or whether it's junk food or anything else that can, that can be, you know, consuming of our time and our energy in an unhealthy way. Man, you, and you named off, when you started off, you named off a number of things that could be causes for something. And it was like almost each and every one of those things you named off are things that we hear people experiencing and not just one, but sometimes all five or six of them at once. Yeah. You know, I, I want to maybe walk through kind of like identifying if we can, because, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll just use a personal example. I have somebody in my life, a very dear friend who I've known for a very long time and who I see, you know, addressing things, you know, coping in a way that may not be the healthiest. And it seems like he is turning to substances <clears throat> to mm -hmm. try to navigate through this time. I'm not sure how to even approach it. I'm not sure where that's where that line is of him just trying to, you know, pacify things versus him actually getting dependency is sure. as somebody who's concerned about a loved one. Like how, how do I start to identify that? Because I find myself struggling with, you know, taking that hat off of being mm -hmm. just a concerned loved one. And then also sure. looking at the background I have in psychology and, and seeing things. And I don't know if I'm <laughs> right. creating bias about it or if I'm being paranoid about it. What are some things that we Yeah, have? there's certainly that chance for creating bias, you know, and, and you know this to be true, the confirmation bias. Once we have an assumption, then we'll see more and more evidence that supports that assumption. Uh, and that, so that becomes our perception uh, where we might ignore or minimize evidence to the contrary. So that's certainly something that we can be prone to and something to recognize. But what I always recommend for anybody who is dealing with a loved one is the first thing is understand and the reality that any action that they do is an action for them, not against somebody else. So even mm -hmm. when consequences seem to affect other people, they're not doing these actions or continuing these actions as an attempt to affect somebody else negatively. They're doing it for themselves. And the reality is they're doing it if they do become uh, more reliant on these substances or, or behaviors. And I'm just speaking from personal experience. It's because we at the, t <laughs> at the time don't have the coping mechanisms or don't have the ability to deal with the situation in another way where our normal capacity to deal with that discomfort is not there. I say that because the only way, the only way I recommend dealing with somebody else who's struggling is it has to be pure compassion, pure acceptance, and a pure attempt to understand their situation. Because anything other than that is only going to exacerbate the emotional situation or the challenge that they're facing. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people that attempt, you know, judgment and um, shaming and punishment and imposing consequences. And I can understand where that comes from. It, um, you know, we, I, I think we've kind of been conditioned to think that that might help somebody change their actions if maybe the consequences get more and more severe because we're withholding our connection, we're withholding our love, we're withholding our acceptance. And maybe that will in, uh, change somebody or influence them to change. But in reality, it does the exact opposite. All it does is perpetuate the shame, the fear, uh, the unrest, the emotional challenges that they're going through uh, when we, if we ever approach somebody in that way. So uh, anything other than just compassion and acceptance is more likely to make the problem worse than better. That said, love and compassion in and of itself is not enough to help somebody move beyond addiction or move beyond that propensity of, of numbing or avoiding that pain uh, that's inside of them. If love was enough, then nobody would struggle with addiction because we could simply love somebody out of that situation. But anything other than pure love, compassion, acceptance, understanding um, is, is more likely to make the situation worse. Doesn't mean, you know, we, I say that with a caveat that you've got to be uh, understanding of yourself and, and, and aware of yourself. And if you can't, you know, if you're not in a good enough place to continue uh, with that same level of involvement or connection, uh, offering that compassion, then recognize that and protect yourself and protect that person from you offering anything else. Uh, I don't know if that kind of makes sense, but as long as we're bringing the best version of ourselves forward and our best attempt at compassion and acceptance and support, um, then I think, uh, you know, that's the best way to approach it, especially a loved yeah, one or somebody that's close to us. I felt that compassion piece because I'm, you know, my, by behavior default to fixer, right? I want to problem solve. I see a problem. I want to, I want to fix it. Right. I, 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 
and I understand how important the emotional piece is, but then when I find myself emotionally involved, it's like the emotional piece goes out the door. Logic says one plus one equal needs to equal two, even though mm-hmm. I recognize two plus two is probably equaling eight for them or something like that. Sure. For somebody, so f- when when we have that thing and we, we have the emotional involvement with someone and we're, we're trying to be compassionate, we're trying to be loved, and if there is, how do we how do we toe that line of boundaries or is there a line where if there's consequences with it? So I can imagine right now people who are living with somebody and they might see it developing or there might be, uh, maybe they're mismanaging finances or mm-hmm. you know, mismanaging other relationships. How, how do we, how do we, or is there a line we draw? You know, how do we begin to approach those types of things to be compassionate and loving for them, but also to not, give so much of ourselves where we feel like we're in a place of, I don't know what the word is like deprivation or we're in a place yeah. where we don't, we don't feel stable with ourselves. personal sacrifice. Yeah. yeah. So uh, kind of one way I, I think about this or talk about this is as responsible benevolence. So being responsible with our connection and what we're, uh, what we're exposing ourselves to and being aware of what our own limits are. And that's kind of why I recommend, you know, being aware of where you are mentally and where you are, and what you can endure and not exceeding that um, because then, you know, then, then the house of cards will come crumbling down for everybody and, and all it will do is fuel more, more anger, more fear, more judgment. Um, but there's certainly boundaries are certainly important, especially when your life is intermingled or, uh, you know, with somebody else, if those finances, if a situation like that are, um, are uh, do relate to you as well, then certainly there needs to be boundaries. And because we, we, we have this potential to cross over from supporting somebody to enabling their actions. If we're not keeping up those boundaries, if we're not helping uh, maintain a sense of accountability, not just for them, but for ourselves as well, then, then yeah, we can, we can actually be somebody that's, that's furthering the problem that we're trying to avoid or trying to help. Uh, there, you know, there's a lot of different tools and resources out there for uh, identifying and establishing those boundaries, um, but certainly something to be aware of, something to be mindful of. Um, one thing I, I certainly recommend is the same things that we can do with ourselves. And this is a lot of what I've been offering to people as we go through this time, things that we can do to help avoid that tendency toward relying uh, on that external substance or behavior, becoming over-reliant on it. If we can just understand the human nature and what leads somebody to that, and we can see this in ourselves and we can do some things, we can take some steps to protect ourselves from that, then we can also uh, encourage or uh, you know, empower other people to do these same kind of things. And in doing so, we come from more of an empowered place, an educated place. We feel more in control or have a greater sense of control. And we don't, yeah, we don't feel as out of control because that's what fuels the sense of anxiety. And again, if you're enmeshed with somebody or if you're very close uh, with somebody, then any anxiety that you feel is going to exacerbate theirs and, and vice versa. That that control piece. So or what are some things we can do? Because I imagine, so we're, we're going, a lot of times we're going to try to find a way to cope or hey, what, how'd you say it before? So well said, uh, they, they give that emotional release, right? It's the, or the yes. emotional disbursement. How'd you say it? Yeah. Just discharging it or discharge, numbing it. Yeah. Discharge. Yeah. So how is finding control? Could that be something to find another way to have that emotional discharge? Is it finding, is it creating another routine when our routine might be disrupted? What does that look like for us? Yeah, certainly. So one thing to understand about, so anxiety, I think is one of the most common emotions that comes up in people, uh, especially people that are early in a recovery journey. So moving beyond that active stage of addiction in your life. And that's really, that's predominantly who I work with. They're people that are in addiction recovery to help them navigate some of the challenges and obstacles that come up uh, for that life in recovery so that they can successfully Uh, exceed previous limitations of shame, of guilt, of self-doubt. But one of the things that comes up most commonly is this experience of anxiety. And one of the reasons is for people in recovery is many times it's that emotion of anxiety that comes up. Anxiety to me, I understand as an emotional response to feeling like we are out of control or don't have control over fulfilling a basic human need that we have. So whatever that is, whether it's security, whether that's connection, uh, whether that's being accepted, loved and you know loved and accepted, or whether it's just something that we need, we need financial security, we need to be able to provide for ourselves, we need to have some semblance of meaning and purpose in our lives, we need to uh, feel like we have security and physical health. Anytime one of those basic needs or those you know you think of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, anytime one of those needs, we feel like 
we aren't in control of whether or not that gets fulfilled, this creates that sense of anxiety. Think about some of the times that you've been most anxious in your life. If your job is threatened, but it's not up to you whether or not you can keep that job, it's somebody else's decision. Or you know, a financial situation where you feel like you're out of control. The health of yourself or a loved one, if that gets challenged and feel, you, know, that you feel like you don't have control over whether or not that connection uh, will continue. These are the times we feel most anxious. And when people are in active addiction or when people are moving in that direction where it becomes uh, very risky because of the substance or behavior, many times they're using it to numb that sense of anxiety. They have control over that anxiety. It's just that they have this external stimulus that they need to control mm -hmm. that sense of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And that's why it comes up so much for people that are early in recovery because they've lost that mechanism, that external mechanism that they became reliant on to calm that anxiety. So they you know, not only does that anxiety come up normally, but they feel more anxious because they've lost their ability to control it. So what, what I highly recommend and what I work with people through is developing uh, or, or regaining our natural mechanisms for discharging that anxiety. And one of, the, one of the, the most basic things that we can do is anxiety comes from when we're focused on all the things that we can't do or can't control. If we can focus our mind and attention on the things that we can do and can control, this goes a long way to naturally discharging some of that anxiety. You might not be able to, you know, make big sweeping changes in your life or, uh, or, or make a drastic change in something, but there are, but what you can do is you can physically move your body. You can, you know, the, that emotional state is going to get stuck within us. And the more that we tense up, the more that we sit still, the longer it will, it will persist. So a simple thing that we can do is, you know, just physically move our body. A simple thing that we can do is if we have a large obstacle or a large challenge in front of us, just start making a list of a few small steps that we can do uh, to move in the right direction in that, because this focuses mm -hmm. our mind and attention on the things that we can do and the control that we do have. And that naturally allows us to move through or release some of that anxiety. But all of these are things that take action and take some awareness, uh, take some accountability, take some coaching to, to bring back into your life or to develop in your life. And unless you, uh, unless you take that, that action, that set in that intention and taking that action, then that anxiety can continue to grow and continue to fester. Do we need to, when we're, when we're doing that, do we need to, or do people maybe struggle with qualifying the significance of the, the significance of the action they're taking as it being enough? And I'll, I'll give you context with it. I was talking with someone the other day and we were talking about grief people are feeling from a, from losing their job and there, there's mm -hmm. the loss of identity. It's layered into that loss of significance, loss of importance, being not valued as a man, a woman, a provider, a husband, a wife, all those types of things. And we were talking about troubleshooting through that. And they were saying one of the things that the person was struggling with who they were using as an example was this person was a, a fairly well-respected business individual and had a title, had a team, had all those types of things, company expense account, mm -hmm. and trying to get them to focus on what they could control at that time. To them, they understood it logically, but they emotionally struggled with it being significant enough in their context of what they felt they should be doing or the level they should be playing at. Uh, I saw another example, actually, just before we spoke, where Joe Rogan had a clip of him talking with Mike Tyson, and Mike Tyson says he doesn't work out anymore, because he, if he does, as soon as he does, it flips his ego. And the only way he's learned to keep his ego out of it and is to not put himself in those dynamics where it does it. So mm. is that a, when we're looking at control, do we have to also assess or assign significance to it? Or is that, you know, overthinking it or? <clears throat> no, I think, you no, know, it's a great point. Because uh, you talk both about the, the emotion and the, the rational ability to understand what's going on. And where all addictions lie and all the troublesome behaviors lie is on the emotional place and, and the emotional place of our brain, the emotional way uh, that we recognize things doesn't correlate with the rational part of our brain. Look at the way the brain functions. And as soon as you feel stressed out and your cortisol and adrenaline start to pump, then the first thing that happens is you begin to lose function of your prefrontal cortex, which is where we rationalize and understand and analyze mm -hmm. things. And it's also where our great creativity lies. So, uh, and this is what, can lead so many people into trouble situations with addictive substances and behaviors and also lead them back toward a relapse if they're living in recovery is when those stresses pile up it moves yeah it it, it uh, so our prefrontal cortex one of the main things it does is it disinhibits or it inhibits our our uh 
the chance that we'll do a bad action. So it's, you know, think of our mind, it, it's constantly looking at all the things that we can do and our prefrontal cortex tells us, don't do these things because of the negative consequences that are gonna come from it. Well, when we're in a very stressed place, our ability to rationalize that and prevent ourselves from doing these actions, that goes away, that, that becomes inhibited. So that's why people will, can, will likely do more risky behaviors or do things that they will later regret or don't want to do mm -hmm. when they are very stressed out because of the way that their brain is functioning. Uh, that said, I think one of the reasons that looking at what we can control is so effective is because it forces that part of our brain to kind of come back online. It requires our creativity. It requires some analytic ability to look at these things that are more positive. We can get into this cycle, this downward spiral, this downward cycle, where if we're focusing on the negative and we're sitting in those negative states, then our mind will just become flooded with all the other associated negative thoughts or negative feelings that uh, you know are exacerbated by that. And that creates this, this worsening situation. So I, I certainly see your point about qualifying it and trying to, you know, and maybe scaling it or understanding the scale of these positive things. And, and that can be important, but Basically, it's like we're looking at black and then we start to look at white. We start to look mm. at, you know, something that's yeah. different. Uh, we start to look at something that's positive. And in doing so, we open up space. We allow space for more positive things to come to mind. The reason that looking at what we can control is so effective is because, again, this brings us back to that place where now we're focusing on something that we can control, no matter how small it is, whether I'm just controlling this pen around my desk and I'm focusing on that, it's bringing my presence, my awareness to that and, uh, and my awareness to what I'm doing and what I can control. And it helps me at least release some of that charge of those emotions that are stimulated by all the things I can't control. That's super helpful. And I love that, that distinction of the black and white, the, the person who's, so, you know, one of the challenges I, as I see it right now is, is a lot of people are, we're in that shelter in place and people might be spending more time alone. Mm -hmm. And in that alone time, they might have more alone time with their thoughts and they may have, they may not have the mental and emotional discipline in that space with their thoughts too. So is there, is there something that we can do as outsiders to support them? Is it calling in? Is it texting them? Is it, and if we are, you know, does it, is there a way to do it where it doesn't seem, or does it even seem, um, you know, I don't know if placating is the right word, but you, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're, it doesn't seem obligatory, but it really seems like you're, you're checking in, but you're not checking off a to-do list. Yeah, certainly. So, uh, so a couple of things there is you talk about the isolation and, and the physical distancing. So one thing that I really want people to understand, and this isn't just during this time in our, in our history, but also in life in general, that social connection is vital. It's vital for our survival. It's vital for our emotional health. And the more that we can stay socially connected, now there's this time of social distancing, which I think is a terrible misnomer because it makes people think that you're supposed to socially distance where in actuality it's physically distance. Uh, social connection is what we really need now, even though it's gonna look different, but at any time in our life, social connection, it helps us deal with the stress hormones, the, the cortisol, the adrenaline and things in our life. Our bodies are designed to flourish the more social connection that we have. So, so understanding that in yourself and encouraging that in other people can certainly help. Also, while you're engaged in that social connection and you're not sitting alone with your thoughts, you know, a lot of people have lost many of those normal distractions that they have where their mind is occupied on something, the normal chores, the normal routines that occupy their mind. And when you lose that, yes, you're certainly left alone a lot more with your thoughts. And if those are negative thoughts, then that can have a much more uh, dramatic effect or drastic effect than, than during the normal course of your life when you have these other distractions. Uh, so being mindful of that in ourselves and then also... And I would, I would suggest that instead of you feeling obligated to do it or feeling like you're doing it as a gesture for the care of somebody else, recognize the benefit that you get. One of the, one of the books I wrote was Charity, the Gifts of Giving. And the whole point of that book was to remind people that anytime we do something for the benefit of another person, we also receive mm -hmm. benefit from that gesture. And if you're, if you're inspired to do that action because you feel, you're in an emotional place and you want to reach out because you know that you'll feel better than when you did, that's perfectly fine because you're going to benefit and that person that you connected with is going to benefit. So if you, 
if you feel like you're doing it out of obligation or you feel like it's a checklist thing, then make it a checklist for yourself and recognize the benefit that you're getting from it and how you will feel better in the social connection and that value that you'll get from that experience and not, not just that you're doing it because it's an obligation. You must care for somebody else. I love that. I, I, that's awesome. The, we started to touch on this early on. And I want to circle back to this. Yeah. Do we, is there, and you had mentioned there's some metrics. So somebody who's going into and in, in this time and they may be developing one or it may be they are on the fringe and it might be emerging. Is there, is there quantifiable numbers? Like I, you know, as a kid or going through school, you hear like, Oh, when it, the, bring a six pack a day home or something like that. It's a six pack a day habit, but is it really have to be a six pack a day? Does it have to be like where somebody might have had a social drink twice a week? Now they're up to five times a week and it's just one, but it's the frequency is increasing. Like where, where does that line get drawn for? Yeah. And is it quantity or is it frequency? That's something that we should be paying more attention to. Yeah, I think for, well, for everybody in this, you know, this is for every substance and behavior. It's, it's, it's absolutely a personal thing and it's not necessarily about what they're doing, but why they're doing it. If somebody needs, if they constantly need something to sit with themselves or to feel okay with themselves or to feel like they can love and accept themselves as they are, then it can be any substance. It can be any behavior. You know, there's some that there's some behaviors that are more socially acceptable, like workaholism or becoming, uh, you know, or, or, uh, people that are working out all the time and feel like they can't ever work out enough. These things are more socially acceptable and we just pass it off as though that guy's really fit. Mm -hmm. He's really, and, and there can be some truth to that, but if you're doing it because you need that escape, if you're doing it because you need to justify yourself, you need to feel worth, uh, you, you need that for your sense of worth. And that's where the concern comes in. And that's why it's so different for everybody. For somebody, they might be reaching for that junk food because they just want to enjoy it. Other people might be reaching for it mindlessly just because they need to numb some kind of sensation in you. That's, and that's been the biggest advice that I've had for people during this time is just drawing more awareness to being more mindful of these activities and these substances that we're indulging in during these times and be really mindful of the emotional state that we're in when we're doing it. The more mindlessly that we expose ourselves to things that that have this addictive tendency or, or this propensity for addiction, the more mindlessly that we do it, the more dangerous it is because the more passively we're conditioning ourselves to need that. Um, can I, but can if you, can you define? Sorry to interrupt you. Can you define mindlessly? Because I want to make sure people understand kind of what that is. Yeah, certain. So it, you know, we've all experienced times where we we found ourselves sitting and eating something, and then think back. Was I even really hungry when I was eating this thing or did I just kind of go over because I was bored because I was passing time because I thought potato chips and I went to the cabinet and I got it or was I eating it for a certain, you know, because I, because I was hungry because I wanted it. Uh, sitting here looking at, you know, social media, are we, are we aware of how much time we're just sitting here like scrolling through our social media feed because the more awareness that we can draw to it, this is, this is a, a fundamental to the work that I do with people in recovery is assessing that draw or assessing the craving. So if we can think about the situation that we're in and the emotion that we're feeling when we reach for that thing, that can really help us clue into if there is a need that we feel is not addressed, if there is some kind of emotion or the discomfort uh, that, that needs to be addressed because then we can most, more likely associate with it uh, what's going on. A lot of people, they have strong cravings when they're heading home from work. Maybe they're heading home to a situation or an environment that they don't feel great. Maybe they've been numbing or, or distracting their mind all day as they're at work and now they have to go home and sit with their thoughts and they're, you know, and they're not great thoughts. So they reach for that thing that helps them escape once again or numb those concerns. So the more mindful that we can be of it, and I'm, and I'm not telling, I'm not saying or suggesting that we should avoid everything that could potentially become addictive because everything in, in, in our lives that can uh, you know, create a dopamine response in our body has a propensity to become addictive or the, the, uh, the chance of becoming addictive, which is foods, you know, salts, sweets, anything um, can, can really fall into that category. My suggestion is that we just become more mindful of it. And if we're gonna sit down and scroll through social media, just recognizing the amount of time that we're doing it, recognizing if we're trying to escape or get away from something, um, an example of this in my life. So there was a couple, it was a couple months ago now, but there was one evening where I had plans and I was going to, uh, I was going to hang out with my daughter. And at the last minute she had a play date. So I went and I dropped her off at her friend's house. And then I was sitting there and I sent a couple text messages to friends to see what they're up to. And I didn't hear back from anybody. 
So all of a sudden I had this huge craving to either go drink a beer, go get a milkshake, go do something that I recognize, oh, that's an escape. The reason I have this strong feeling to do that right now is because I want to escape from this uncomfortable situation that my mind is telling myself, you know, that, that dirty voice in our head that wears down our self-esteem and our sense of worth that started mm -hmm. chiming in like, oh, nobody's writing back to you because nobody loves you. Nobody wants to hang out with you. Like you have no, no connections. There's nothing to do. I was able to recognize that, you know, the, that voice in my head, recognize that that's not true, but it was because of that cravings that I had that kind of alluded me to that. So that, so bringing some mindfulness to that and questioning why we're having that craving and questioning if we are, find ourselves in the middle of doing something like sitting there, uh, you know, eating, eating that second bowl of ice cream or, or down at the bottom of that bag of chips, just recognizing, oh my gosh, I was just doing that mindlessly. Um, uh, and didn't rec you know, didn't realize what I was doing because if we can bring more mindfulness back to it, then these, then these activities and the behaviors and these substances, then we can get some enjoyment out of it. I'm not saying don't eat potato chips, but if you're doing it, then at least be mindful of it so you can enjoy it and get something from it. Um, yeah, that's super helpful. I think that's such an important distinction too. Like just, uh, I, I know I can't even count how many times I went to have a, I was telling you beforehand, peanut butter pretzels from Trader Joe's have been my thing during this. And, yeah. and I've caught myself more than three times having my handful and then realizing I was already on a second or third handful because I've yeah. completely been absent minded about eating the first one. Mm -hmm. Or I'd taken it from drawing it out and making it savory to just, you know, pounding them in instead of just sure. eating one little bite at a tiny five. Garrett, I have so much more I want to ask you, but we only have an, another minute or so. And I hear you keep saying, so maybe we'll end with this. I hear you keep saying about being mindful and mm -hmm. being mindful, being more mindful, being mindful of what you're doing. Is there, is there a, a mindfulness routine or mindfulness exercise or mindfulness habit or ritual that people can start to develop and to help them be aware of what the thought process and what the emotional state is that's coming up for them that you might recommend people walk away from this with? Yeah, so many different things. Uh, just any practice that we can do that's regular, whether it's a gratitude practice, anything that's drawing our mind and attention to a specific task that we're going through that has a positive charge to it or positive effect, or just any activity that you engage in that you can bring some more mindfulness to it. And there's you know tons of articles and stuff that talk about how you can be more mindful, but a simple thing like washing your hands. If you can be fully present in that moment, while you're washing your hands, then this starts to develop and, and build that capacity to be more mindful in other places in our life. And we'll find ourselves swept away less often uh, doing these mindless consumptions or these mindless activities less often uh, because we're, we're building up that muscle. And that's really what I, what I see it as. I think of our ability to be mindful really as a muscle. And the more that we can practice that with a simple thing for three to five minutes a day, the more we'll see that, that benefit or the benefit of that carrying over. That's super helpful, man. Garrett, this has been incredible. Everyone, you're going to want to rewatch and rewatch and take some notes. There is so much just wisdom and nuggets of information in here from not just addressing addiction or what may become addiction, but also just living, I think, a really great life. I love that Garrett doesn't segment it out, but identifies it as behaviors and it can include food or can include adult movies or social media and all those types of things, anything that we start to have a behavior going towards that might be taking away from quality of life, whether it's, uh, I love that dispersing of, of emotional energy. And if we had to start developing routines, because again, so many of our routines have been taken out of how we might normally do that, to be mindful of that, to come back and be mindful. And if you're in a position where you might have a loved one, someone you care about who's starting to struggle or you think they're struggling, to recognize that love and compassion is really going to be the antidote to it and the support system that they need that people, I love the distinction he made too, that people aren't doing it to you. They're doing it to them. And it's not, you know, so often we will personalize the behaviors of others and make it seem like they're really out trying to hurt ourselves. Where if we were out of our, our ego, maybe and in our more quiet, honest moments, we realize how true what is, what he said is that people are doing things because they feel they feel uncertain. They feel scared. They feel a lack of self-confidence. You know, imagine how you felt during that time. And maybe it gives you the grace to find the love and compassion that you need to support them through it, but also recognize what you need to do to take care of you. And I'd love to acknowledge that. And it's so important that we, you know, we're securing our oxygen mass first so that we have enough airflow to assist others. Coming back to being mindful, 
you know, slowing down. And I, I love that something as simple as washing your hands, because it's something that, gosh, we've been hearing that over and over again, how many times we wash our hands. Yeah. But do we really slow down and pay attention to it? Have we really ever felt the water on our hands and noticed the soap and how it moves through our fingers and our fingertips? And just the act of doing that, how it can bring you out of the distracted mind and into a really present moment. And gosh, what a beautiful way to be able to not just address what may be going on, but really create a foundation for life going forward is learning to be mindful and present. Garrett, this has been absolutely incredible, man. Thank you so much for sharing. This has been a, an absolute blessing and such well-needed information. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Absolutely, man. We'll see you next time, everybody, on another edition of A Handful of Hope. Bye-bye.